I must admit that uh, I feel privileged uh, to be able to find a chance to come and share God's word with this wonderful congregation. Uh, and so, God bless you. And because you look like you listen to me, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, as, as our pastor has mentioned, uh, we are part of... Uh, um, a team put together by our fathers um, in the African chapter of Salt and Light just to think through how we can rise up and uh, uh, take dominion in Africa uh, for the kingdom of God. And so we were having conversations on how we can take dominion, dominion in the several sectors of societies the seven mountains that uh, we, we've been talking about and praying about. And so we are excited that something has begun to happen. Amen? And so you are part of something special that is happening in Africa for the glory of God. And I can guarantee you, Africa will not be the same again because of what will happen as a result of this movement. And so we thank God for that. Thank, we thank God for your leaders, especially here in uh, Uganda. You've got amazing fathers that are giving us amazing leadership. Consider yourselves privileged. Amen. I have, I have walked around several African countries, and this is one of the countries that has got a, an amazing heritage of spirituality. No wonder the devil has been doing a lot to fight it. But God is faithful. Amen. Amen. The devil has been defeated. Africa is arising. Amen. 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 Don't you never tell him it's not a mistake. We are called the pearl of Africa. <laughs> it's not a mistake. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, bringing you greetings from... Uh, um, uh, Deliverance Church Umoja and uh, the leadership of Deliverance uh, Billy Bishop, Bishop J.B. Masinde rather um, and the leadership there I hope you can receive the greetings <laughs> Amen uh, Greetings from my wife she didn't sp specify how I should pass the greetings <laughs> but greetings from my wife and my children I, I am married to a lady called Rahadia. Is there a name like that in Uganda? <laughs> Rahadia. All right, Rahadia. There's none. Wow, that's why I married her. <laughs> because she had a unique name. She has a unique name. And, and we have uh, been married for 20 years. Uh, and we have two young men. I call them boys. One is 17 and the other one is... Uh, 14 turning 15 in a few months and we bless the Lord. Amen. I want to share a few thoughts and I will try not to keep you here for too long. Uh, just a few words of instructions. I said in the morning when I came I was amazed by the theme and of focus that you have for this year. Um, Isaiah 54 verses 2. And I want us to read it loudly enough to inconvenience your neighbor. Can you do that? Okay, I'll count to two, and then we will read it together. Amen? All right, one, two. Enlarge the place of your tent. One. And strengthen your stakes. Amen. And, and the reason why God is giving us those instructions is in verse 3. It says, because you will do what? You will expand. Let's just leave it there. Turn to your neighbor to them. You will expand. No, they, they look like they, they don't believe you. So prophesy for yourself. Tell them, I will expand. You know, I, have no, I normally say if my neighbor doesn't have faith, I will carry my own faith. <laughs> I will expand. I will expand. And, 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 and you know what? I feel that's very prophetic, not only for this church, but for you as an individual. You that is sitting under the grace of this house. 
this is a word for you you will expand to the left to the right in the name of jesus amen Amen. and so i sense god wants us to receive some instructions uh, that will help us with regards to that prophetic word that he has given us you know when i was when i was a little boy i was telling uh, people in the first service when i was a little boy i used to have dreams and my one of one key things about my dreams is that i dreamt i would be a professional footballer professional footballer i would be playing in europe in some serious league earning serious money of course and I used to dream, I used to take, you know, pictures of serious footballers and, you know, and cut them and, you know, paste them on my exercise books. Uh, and so sometimes I would just sit in my in class and the teacher is teaching and I'm just looking at those pictures. I'm just seeing myself there. I'm just seeing myself, you know, playing in Europe. Uh, Turn to your neighbor, tell them your dreams are valid. <laughs> but clearly those dreams never came to pass. <laughs> But God gave me a bigger dream. Amen? God gave me a bigger dream. I don't know. I don't know if you had dreams when you were young. Uh, please, would you take 30 seconds of my time? I'm giving you 30 seconds of my time, which rarely happens with many preachers. Please make use, make use of it wisely. Mention quickly to your neighbor the dreams you had when you are... Uh, even if they have not come to pass, just mention them. Alright, just mention them to your neighbor. Just 30 seconds. What dreams did you have when you were young? What... Miss Uganda, you know, Miss. (laughs) All right, some of you had very brief dreams. Amen. I want to draw your attention to a young man in scripture a certain gentleman in scripture that had dreams and then i want us to look at one or two things that happened because of those dreams so turn if you if you if you let me turn your bibles to genesis 37 and we're going to read you know a few verses and then i'm going to refer to other verses in 39 40 and 41 and 45 uh, of genesis genesis 37 verses 5 to nine it says now joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more so he said to them please hear this dream which i have dreamed there were binding sheaves in the field there we were binding sheaves in the field then behold my sheep arose and also stood upright and indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf and his brothers said to him shall you indeed reign of us or shall you indeed have dominion of us so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers whisper to your neighbor dream again especially those who clearly their dreams never came to pass you remember the dreams they told you (laughs) let him dream another dream (laughs) May God give you another dream. Amen. His dream in Jesus' name. And so then he dreamed still another dream and told this to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. May God bless the reading of his word. Now you know the story. Uh, because after, after Joseph um, uh, told his brothers, and, and eventually told his parents these dreams uh, you know the story that they were not as equally excited as he was because Joseph got excited when he got dreams from God and clearly these dreams were from God and so God gave him a clear picture of the future that he has for him and now I pray in the name of Jesus that God will give people in this place a clear picture of what he has in store for them in the name of jesus may god open his heavens and reveal to you the things that he has in store for you because the bible says i know the plans that i have for you they are of good and not of evil to give you a future full of hope there is hope in jesus name 
I said there is hope in Jesus' name. And may God reveal it to you. And so, believing that his immediate family will share in his excitement, he couldn't wait to come and share with them. And so, he shared with them. And to his shock, to his shock, they did not receive the story very well. I mean, they, they, they were not anywhere near sh- to share in his excitement. <laughs> you know, it may be important to note, good people, that not everyone will share in the excitement of the dreams that God has given you. Hello? And so it is important to know who you will share those dreams with. Hello? There are others who are deliberate dream killers. And there are others who are dream enablers. I pray that God will bring in your path dream enablers. People that will hold your hand and walk with you towards your dreams. In the name of Jesus. You, there was a word that was used here that God will castrate some people. <laughs> May God castrate every dream destroyers in the mighty name of Jesus. <laughs> I loved those testimonies. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I thought we should just give an offering and go home because that was powerful. <laughs> and, and you would have thought that the opposition that Joseph received from his family was the worst thing that was about to happen uh, with regards to him sharing his dreams. But, but as you follow the Bible, you realize, unknown to Joseph, the realization of those dreams that God had given him would be accompanied by three critical tests. And these tests are for everyone that God Uh, will ever bring to the place of the realization of the dreams that God has for them. See, it was one thing for God to reveal to you, it's one thing for God to reveal to you your wonderful future. But it is another thing altogether for God to prepare you for that future. You see, we love the promises of God. They are yes and amen. But sometimes we shy away from the process that is attached to the promise. See, in God's economy, process is everything. Process is everything. Because God has no problem in expanding you. God has no problem in fulfilling his promises. Let me tell you, the last thing you should be worried about is God fulfilling his promises. He says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of God that he should change his Son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said it? Will he not do it? The last thing you should be worried about is God fulfilling his promises. If I were you, I would begin to focus on God preparing me. Am I postured properly for the fulfillment of those promises? And so, as far as God is concerned, preparation for where he is taking you is more critical than the revelation of where he is taking you. You see, the children of Israel were promised Canaan. But little did they know that it was going to take 40 years of preparation Abraham was promised to be the father of nations, but he did not know that it was going to take 25 years of preparation. David was anointed to become king over Israel, but he did not know that it was going to take 17 years of preparation before he could sit on the throne. Preparation is critical. Joseph got excited at the dreams that God had given him. But he did not know it was going to take 13 years of preparation before he comes to the realization of those dreams. That's why good people, I would suggest to us that the path of process, the path of process precedes the place of promise. I said the path of process precedes the place of promise. Now I can guarantee you from this moment moving forward, most of you will find it hard to say amen. But I am prepared for that. And so just listen to me. All I'm begging you is just listen to me. The path of process precedes the place of promise. Say, say, it, say it to yourself. Say the path of process precedes the place of promise. 
See, see, many times process contains a series of tests. Before God can entrust you with what he has promised you, or the dream and the vision he has shown you, he will test you. And you know, many times God will test you to bring the best out of you. But sometimes the devil will want to take advantage of it and tempt you to bring the worst out of you. But I pray that in this congregation, the best will come out of you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And so, I want to focus on three critical tests. And test number one that, that Joseph went through. Test number one, and I will talk briefly about it, is a test of obedience. Test of commitment. Test of commitment. Which is the test of obedience? You see, in that story, um, in Genesis 37 from verse 14 to 17, Jacob, the father of Joseph, gives Joseph instructions. Somebody say instructions. And tells Joseph, go and look for your brothers who have been going, who had gone out a couple of days to feed the flocks. And they had gone to a place called Shechem. And you know, Jacob tells Joseph, go and look for them and find out how they are doing. And Shechem was about 60 kilometers from where uh, uh, Jacob Um, And his family were living. And so Joseph takes off and goes and looks for his brothers. He looks for his brothers. He looks for his brothers. He can't find them. In Shechem. And then, you know, when he's about to say, you know, um, uh, let me go back. He decides to ask a few people. Now, if Joseph had gone back after not finding his brothers in Shechem, he would have fulfilled what his father had asked him to do. Right or wrong? He would have fulfilled but then something inside of him says, no, 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 ask. And then he asks, have you seen some ten men with a lot of cattle? And he's told, yeah, we saw them going in that direction. They have gone into, an, probably they have gone to a city called Dothan, which was 30 kilometers away from Shechem. Guess what? Joseph decides to go 30 kilometers more to find his brothers. That is the kind of attitude that God will accelerate to the place of promise. The attitude that says, I will not just obey what God has told me, I will go an extra mile to do what God has asked of me. The test of obedience. As God asked you to talk to people in your neighborhood about Jesus, go an extra mile. As God asked you and put it in your heart to support his work here, go an extra mile. As God put it in your heart to bless sister so and so, brother so and so, go an extra mile. As God asked you to forgive your mother-in-law, go an extra mile and bless her. It is that kind of attitude that says I must go the extra mile that accelerates you to the place of God's purpose for your life. Listen to me, children of God. God will never move you beyond your last point of obedience. God will never move you beyond your last point of obedience. I sense that there are some of us here whom God has given specific instructions on one or two things, yet we are struggling to obey those instructions. I release you now in the name of Jesus. I release you now in the name of Jesus. May you find the boldness and the courage to take the step of fulfilling what God has been putting in your heart. In the name of Jesus! You would have thought... You would have thought that, that the, the immediate repercussions of obedience would be more blessing. <laughs> and, and, and I know we, that's what we expect many times when we are walking in obedience with God. But, but the interesting thing is that the immediate repercussions of Joseph obeying the instructions of his father was he landed into more trouble. But allow me to suggest to you that you should never be deceived by the circumstances that may come, especially when you're walking in obedience with God. Don't be deceived. Because sometimes when we are walking in obedience with God, things may look like they are going in the opposite direction, but do not allow circumstances to deceive you when you're walking in obedience with God. 
Be like Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 too, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He despised the circumstances around him and focused on where God was taking him in the name of Jesus. He was not distracted. And so Joseph passed with flying colors. He, he, got, he, got, he, got, he got the marks on this. But then something interesting happened. You, you, you would have thought that when he arrives at Dothan, his brothers would be excited. Woohoo! Yeah! Woo -loo 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 -loo. Joseph, you have gone out of your way to come and look for us. What a caring brother you are. You would have thought so. But, but guess what they did? You know the story. They got hold of him and stripped him of his garments and threw him in a pit and sold him to slave drivers who went and sold him in Egypt. See, I sense that there are people here who have gotten out of your way for people. And uh, their response has been not what you are expecting. You got out of your way for your husband. You got out, went out of your way for your wife. You went out of your way for your children. But they don't seem to be grateful. May your heart be encouraged in the name of Jesus. It is not in vain. I guarantee you it is not in vain. And so, Joseph lands in Egypt. You know the story. And he becomes a, a servant, a slave in the house of Potiphar. Imagine the embarrassment of being in the slave market, naked, being sold, being auctioned. And so he um, uh, is sold into the house of Potiphar. And he begins to work there. He maintains a very, you know, faithful attitude. He works hard. He's taking care of business. Uh, he's not complaining. He's not murmuring. And you know, that's, that's the kind of attitude that God loves. A faithful attitude. It's, it's, it's an attitude of commitment. Amen? And he continues serving. And I pray, because I sense that there are some of us who are in circumstances that you had not wished you'd ever be in. And you're being tempted to be come unfaithful. I pray, I pray, I pray that God will strengthen your heart to remain faithful. And so Joseph is about to be faced with the next test. Because while he was faithful, Potiphar's wife looks at him and begins to desire him. Because I think Joseph was handsome. He was, you know, a typical Ugandan gentleman. You know, looking all nice, you know. Just the right, you know, texture. <laughs> the right muscled up guy. And, and, and Potiphar's wife begins to make advances at Joseph. And you know the story. And at some point, he says, Joseph, would you sleep with me? But Joseph refuses. See, Joseph came face to face with the test of conviction. I said the test of conviction. The test of conviction. His convictions were being tested there. And listen to how he responded to the Genesis 39 verses 8 to 9. Listen to how Joseph responded. But let me say something. Joseph did not refuse to sleep with Potiphar's wife because she was ugly. And she was not his type of woman. Because you know there people say that's not my type. He, he didn't refuse to sleep with her because she was not his type. He didn't refuse. Potiphar's wife, you know, those days, those, those serious people used to select. <laughs> In fact, they would hold a beauty pigeon to get a wife. Hello? They would just our entire beauty pigeon to get a wife. Can you imagine? <laughs> And so this was, this, was not, this was not your ordinary, you know, uh, you know uh, lightning struck woman asking, you know, Joseph, lie with me. No, this was cream of the cream. And so Joseph was not dealing with an ordinary temptation here. And uh, as a matter of fact, every now and then, because of the nature of his work, Potip of, of, of his work Potiphar would not be at home. And so Joseph did not refuse because he was, you know, otherwise. But he ref listen to why he refused. Verse 8 and 9. It says, but Genesis 39, verse 8 and 9. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, 
My master does not know what is with me in the house. He has committed all that he has to my hand. And there is no one greater in the house than I. No, as he kept back anything from me but you. Because you are his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? How can I do? See, please take note of his motivation for refusing. The advancement. His motivation for refusing was this is a sin against God. This, he was saying there is something between me and God that I will sacrifice anything else to protect it. It is that kind of attitude that will accelerate you to the place of your promise. Where you are saying if it is my job I will sacrifice it. If it is coming in my relationship with God I will sacrifice it. If it is that business deal I will sacrifice it. In the interest of my relationship with God. He was a man of conviction. See there are two kinds of Christians. There is the Christian of conviction. And there is a Christian of convenience. So the Christian of conviction is a kind, I said this in the morning, he'll wake up in the morning. The Christian of conviction is a kind, when he wakes up in the morning, it is raining, is it, do they say cats and dogs? It is raining like crazy. The Christian of conviction will say, whether it is raining or not, on a Sunday morning, I must be in the house of God. And I will go and serve God. But the Christian of convenience will say, Ah, don't we have, you know, TBN? Don't we have, you know, you know, Vision TV? Where I can watch some preachers. And they will sleep. The Christian of convenience. You see, when, when you go to any lake, you will see three kinds of boats. You will see a row boat. You know, somebody say row. Row. I don't know if you sang this when you were in primary school. Uh, row, row, row your boat. Okay, there's a row boat, row, row. Is it row or row? You know, it is said that Ugandans have the best English in Africa. By the way, research has determined that. <laughs> and I don't want to contest. <laughs> I don't want. I'll contest when I'm in Kenya, but when I'm here, I, I don't contest. <laughs> row, row your boat. The, this one, you have to push. Then there is the sailboat. Which waits for the wind? For the wind to push it. Depends on the wind. And then there is a speedboat that does not wait for the wind, does not wait to be pushed. You see, the Christians who are robot Christians are the ones whom Pastor Charles here will push. Will push, make announcements 20 times before they respond. But in the name of Jesus, we pray that no one here will continue to be a robot Christian. In the name of Jesus. We are elevating you into a new level. In Jesus name. And then there is a sailboat Christian. When they are in church on Sunday. The preacher has preached. They are, really, they are with the preacher. They are saying yes I am going to do it. But when they go to work on Monday. They are forgotten. When everybody is going this way. They go that way. When everybody is going this way. They go that way. You can't depend on them. We are also elevating those ones. Into a new level. And we declare that right now there is a grace for speedboat Christians in this church. In the name of Jesus. That is your grace in Jesus name. Who do not wait for the wind. They don't have to be pushed. They are ready. They are pushed by an internal force called the Holy Spirit. Ha! They will do it not because the pastor has said. They will do it not because everybody else is doing. They will do it because they have a conviction inside their heart. Now let me show you where this conviction is born. This conviction is born in the place of prayer and reading of God's word. Because look at Genesis 39 verses 2, verses 3, verses 21 and 23. What do they say? All of them they say one thing. The Lord was with Joseph. Now let me tell you something about God. He never forces himself on anyone. He operates by invitation. And if the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph, it means Joseph had created an environment that was inviting for God. And I can guarantee you, the place of creating that environment is a place of spending time with God. 
You can never spend considerable time with God and your life remains the same. If you do those five minutes prayers and run to work, you will be a kawaida person, a usual person. If you do those, you know, three minutes of reading the Bible and you rush to work, you will be a usual person in the streets of Kampala. But I dare you to say, I'm going to spend more time with God. You will be amazed at the results. Look at anyone in the Bible who accomplished anything significant. They spent significant time with God. See, the biggest value of prayer is not what it will change outside. Huh? You know, because we go to prayer praying, or go praying for the government, praying for the neighbors, praying for your place of work. The b- biggest value of prayer is not what it will change externally. The biggest value of prayer is what it changes internally. Because when you spend significant time before God, something rubs on your inner man. Hello, there's something different about you. See, prayer is not just meant for you to express your needs to God. Prayer is meant for you to express your need for God. I want to challenge you in this coming week. To say, I know I need school fees. I know I need this and this. But in this coming week, I'm not going to tell God about my school fees. I'm going to just go before God for an hour and just say, Lord, I just want to worship you. I just want to reach out to you. I just love you, oh Lord. You are the best that has ever happened to me. You are my Lord and my Savior. I submit my thoughts to you. Just spend time with God. Listen to Him. Read his word. Meditate. Something will change. You see, this... <laughs> no, no, let me, let me jump. Let me jump because of time. <laughs> Somebody said the path of process precedes the place of promise. Say it again. The path of process precedes the place of promise. So you would have thought Joseph for being faithful to his convictions, would have landed, you know, some serious promotion. (laughs) Something amazing would have happened. But guess what? (laughs) It went from bad to worse. When you find him in Genesis chapter 40, he is in prison. He's thrown into prison. Because, you know, when Potiphar's wife raised a wrongful accusation against him, he was caught and thrown into prison. But now the tragedy of how he was imprisoned is this, there was no court proceedings. And so there was no, it was, there was no definite jail term. You know, it is easier to know I'm going to be in jail for five years, right? Then you can, you can, you know, you can budget for the you know, perseverance of five years. But you see, for, for Joseph, he never knew. The other prisoners will tell him, you know, I'm here for three months for, you know, stealing maize from, you know, <laughs> that other place. Others would say, you know, I'm here for two years. Others would say, I'm here for ten years. Joseph would say, I'm not sure. <laughs> In a sense, he was facing life imprisonment. And the person who had thrown him into jail was the kind of a person that you cannot bribe anywhere for you to come out of jail. He was in charge of security in the whole land of Egypt. The minister in charge of security is the one who had thrown him in jail. So, so it, I sense there are people here whom your situation has gone to a place where it looks like there is absolutely no hope. I sense there is one or two people here. And I feel God has allowed me to come and share this word to declare in the atmosphere that something is about to change about your situation. In the name of Jesus. Something is about to change about your situation. Don't, don't, don't give up hope yet. Don't give up hope yet. Because I, I sense Joseph had gotten to a place where he was, was almost giving up hope. Because remember, there are two people that had come from the palace uh, as prisoners and, and Joseph interpreted their dreams and Joseph probably had given up hope waiting upon God. He said, please, you know, when you go out there, remember me, whisper to the Pharaoh 
uh, don't whisper to anybody else because nobody else can remove me from here. Whisper to Pharaoh because he knew it's only Pharaoh who can overrule. <laughs> he had almost given up hope, but I pray that you will not give up hope because help is coming in the name of Jesus. Help is coming in the name of Jesus. Galatians 6 9 tell us, let us not grow weary or become discouraged in doing good. For at the proper time, in due season, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. Your due season is coming. I said your due season is coming. Your due season is coming. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So, so Joseph is languishing in prison. <laughs> And you would have thought he is beyond any help from God. But then one day, somebody say one day, one fine morning. It was a usual morning. The, the same birds that used to sing most of the days, the same, you know, prison uh, cockerel. Uh, that there's always a cockerel somewhere <laughs> that wakes people up. Uh, it's the same cockerel that woke up Joseph and he wakes up. It's a usual morning usual prison breakfast you know half cooked porridge and you know you know i don't know what else they take in prison it was going to be a normal day but then suddenly he heard some chariots the noise of some chariots coming and in his mind he thought mm, another bunch of prisoners from the king's palace are coming now I don't know who they'll send. They sent the cup bearer and the baker the other day. But I don't know who they are sending. Maybe there's a laundry person now <laughs> that's coming. And so he waited. Then he heard his, voice, his name. Joseph! The prison warden was calling out. He said, That's it. I'm not going to die. This is the day I was waiting for. I'm going to die. The, pri the, the same chariots that brought him uh, the same channels that are coming and it's the minister in charge of security he knew death sentence so he began saying goodbye to other prisoners you know it's been real uh, knowing you <laughs> it's been real <laughs> but then when he gets out of his cell he's quickly grabbed by these uh, officers from Pharaoh's palace and they shave his beard and they shave him and they change his clothing I mean they get, put him a nude cloth and you know and he's rushed and thrown into the chariot and it's not like the chariot that took him from Potiphar's house this is a different chariot it has got outriders in front and outriders behind hallelujah you know, you woke up in the morning. Because I sense there are some of you. See, it, it, it took a couple of years. It took 13 years for him to sink to the level he had sunk. It took 13 years for him to be reduced to the level he had been reduced. 13 years of suffering. 13 years of loss. 13 years of devastation to the level he had sunk. But listen to me, child of God. It did not take one year. It did not take one one month. It did not take a week. It took a day for God to turn his situation around. And I feel I'm speaking prophetically to someone in this place that has sunk to a particular level. That has experienced an amount of loss. That has experienced a period of trouble in your life. I feel God is speaking prophetically that your turnaround is about to come. And it will happen in such a way that it will surprise you in Jesus name. You see uh, my time is up but I feel I must share this story you see Lazarus uh, uh, died was sick and died and was buried and four days after he was buried is when the Lord Jesus shows up <laughs> yet the Lord Jesus claims to be his friend how about that so if I were you I would not panic yet and when, when, when the Lord Jesus arrived and he stood outside the grave, he said, show me where you buried him. Because he had not finished with Lazarus. And I'm here to declare to somebody in this place, God is not through with you yet. 
as long the bible says as long as you are alive there is hope for the living there is hope for the living god is not through with you yet because lazarus was in the grave and when jesus said lazarus you know by that time his body had begun to waste away there's a worm that had eaten part of lazarus body and had sneaked out of the tomb and that worm had, had been eaten by a bird and that bird had been hunted down by some animal in the in the wilderness and eaten when jesus said la that animal gave up the bird when he said za that bird gave up the worm when he said ras that worm rushed back and produced the flesh it had eaten back to the body of Lazarus. God is about to restore in Jesus name. Sorry, um, I need to give you one more point and then I finish. Just, just bear with me. I need to finish this. See, at that point when he was standing before Pharaoh in, in Genesis 41 and, and moving forward, when he was standing before Pharaoh, Genesis 45 41 rather, standing before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was asking, are you the Joseph I've heard about? Are you the Joseph I've heard about? See, things turned around for Joseph. You know the story. Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt. You know in Kenya at some point we had a prime minister for a period of time, but he was not as powerful as a president. You see, the prime minister that Joseph was given was the kind that is as powerful as the king. Because the king told Joseph, listen, nobody will lift his leg without permission from you in this land. So, so turn to your neighbor tell him, treat me kindly. Treat me kindly. Treat me kindly. Because when my turnaround comes, you may need permission from me to lift your leg. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good people. Genesis 45, Joseph is enjoying his parks as the prime minister. You know, Joseph is, you know, enjoying his time. He has a wife. He has all these things. They're happening. And then, you know, one day, somebody say one day, some relatives from the village come to visit him. I, I don't know if it happens here in Uganda. In, in Nairobi, we have relatives in a country village and then they come and announce. They usually like to come and announce. They come like 10 of them and they have come to visit you. They expect you will clothe them, feed them, you know, uh, you know, give them bus fare to go back. <laughs> you know, and they are coming for two weeks. <laughs> it's a one fine morning. Knock, knock, knock. Guess who's coming into Joseph's palace? Relatives. They are, they are saying, we have come. <laughs> You know, Joseph looked at them and he remembered, these are the men that threw me into a pit. Mercilessly. I pleaded with them and they threw me into a pit. And he was tempted to take revenge. In fact, he was tempted. He threw them in prison a bit. He harassed them a bit because he was wrestling. But I believe deep down beneath all that was bowels of compassion. He was about to experience the test of compassion. The test of compassion. And Joseph overcome that test. See, Genesis 45, 1 to 5. Let's read that in one or two minutes I finish. It says, then Joseph could not control himself. Genesis 45, 1 to 5. In front of all those who attended to him, he called out, Have everyone leave me. So no man stood there. When Joseph then Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. Joseph wept aloud. And the Egyptians who had just left him heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. For they were stunned and dismayed by the fact that they were in the presence of Joseph. And Joseph said to his brothers, listen to this. Please come closer to me. And they approached him. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, do not be distressed or angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me ahead of you to save life and preserve our family. 
Joseph had overcome the test of compassion. See, the test of compassion is about realizing that when God puts you in a place of privilege, it is not just for you. It is for your, for your brothers. It is for your sisters. It is for the glory of God and the extension of his kingdom. You know, this, this, one of the ladies here, sister, you gave up a testimony and said I've been promoted and so I'm bringing a, a, a gift to thank God. It is that kind of attitude that God accelerates. The kind of attitude that says, you know, I am in this place of privilege, not just for me and my family, but that I may help others. I may bless others. I may touch other lives. I may, I may transform people's lives. I may help the orphans. I may help brothers who are struggling. It is that kind of attitude that God has no problem in giving more. I pray that God will give you a heart of compassion in this church. In the name of Jesus. You see, Hannah was barren for a long time. And she prayed. She made all sorts of prayers. She made declarations. She fasted all sorts of fastings. But nothing changed. Until one day, she made a prayer. She said, God, if you give me this child, I'll give this child back to you and to your work. God harassed all the fertility angels and tell them you have only one assignment Hannah I dare you to posture and say God if you give me I will give it back I will give it back I will not hold it and you'll be amazed at what God will do Heavenly Father I thank you for today I thank you for your people I thank you for those who have listened to the sound of my voice. I recognize there are those of us who are struggling with the instructions you have given them. Lord God, I release them from that struggle. In the name of Jesus, that they will accelerate towards the place of your promise for them. There are those of us who have been living in compromise. And their conviction has been tested. And they have compromised and fallen off the way. I release them from that condemnation. And I release them from the place of compromise. And I pray that something will shift in their hearts. That in the name of Jesus from this moment henceforth they will not give in to that area of compromise. I declare victory in their lives over that area of compromise. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I pray, oh God, for someone in this place that has been struggling with a certain relationship, a significant relationship, and there has been bitterness, and there has been anger because of what has been done to them by this significant relationship. Right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I release that brother, I release that sister from the spirit of bitterness. I release them to receive compassion in their hearts in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I give you glory and praise because I thank you for these dear ones that have listened to my voice because you're preparing them for things that they have never heard of, they have never seen, neither has it entered into the hearts of men. And I give you glory and praise. Not only these dear ones, but you're preparing this church for greater things. Things beyond the imagination of this church for the glory of your name. And so I declare your blessing in this altar in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the church says...